Okay, folks. Before I start on today's uh, start of the class test, um, I was supposed to be on CNBC this afternoon after this, my last class on Fast Money talking about Tesla. But markets have a strange way of replacing topics, so I know exactly what the discussion is going to be this evening, right? Have you been watching the markets today? Hey, the Dow is down 3.3%, S&P 500 is down. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to ask you the question so you can feed me the answers I can say on CNBC. Ready? You guys know enough to actually help me out here. So today, U.S. equity markets are down 3.3%. Is it possible that fundamentals explain, that you could explain it entirely with fundamentals? Because your answer is no, then the answer is don't worry, it'll all bounce back, right? So this is, this is the central question. Okay. I think you could, and here's the reason. It's China. And I'm not saying this in the you know, weapon of mass distraction China, but China is not just the second largest economy in the world, it's been responsible for 40% of global growth in the last decade. So much of the growth has come from China. And if you look at company exposures to China, you could make the argument that if this lasts long enough and leaves a deep enough imprint, you could see effect on cash flow. So the answer is, could this be explained by fundamental? Unlike some crises where you say, look, this, there's no way. This can't be a global effect. Greece gets into trouble. Or, you know, I don't expect the, the entire global economy. This is China. This could have an effect. But that said, though, I do think that it's part fundamental. I think ignoring fun and part fear factor. How can we tell? We'll be able to tell in hindsight because the fear factor will subside and you'll see a return. The fundamentals will stay. Right? Is anybody going to be satisfied with this answer? Absolutely not because they want to know, buy, sell, tell me to do, what to do. Right? So let's, your, let's do the follow-up question. Are some companies more exposed to this than others? And, and what kind of, so if you were screening capital IQ for companies that would be in trouble, what are you looking for? You're looking for companies with significant revenue exposure in China. Apple, obviously, 19.6%, you should be scared. Qualcomm, 67% of its revenues come from China. You should be terrified, right? So that, that's going to be the easier number. The other, though, is you also have your production in China. This is a supply chain effect. And that's going to be much more difficult to get, partly because it's not public information. It's not that S&P is holding it back from you, but finding out where production is. So clearly some sectors are going to be affected more. And if you look at the list of, I found a list of the 50 companies with the biggest percentage revenue exposure to China. I'll send you the list if you want. I think like three quarters of them are tech companies. So the tech, the NASDAQ is down more than the S&P 500. And again, from a fundamental perspective, it makes sense. Which leaves you with the final question, what should I do, right? I'll tell you what I'll do, but I don't think this is what you should do. I'm just going to go to sleep for a week, not even look at stocks, because I, my history is whenever I've reacted to something at the moment it's happening, I always do the wrong thing. That's me. Maybe you're much better at, at no, making, I, I just know that whatever I do this evening, right after the market closes, is exactly not the thing I should be doing. Okay. So I'm going to kind of not call AT&T and turn off my cell service for a week. Because if I have broadband, I'm going to be getting online. I'm going to be doing things I shouldn't be doing. Sometimes less is more. You know, you just leave and, and, and we have too much information coming at us. It's a reason we, I mean, the, there, there are actually studies that show the more information you get and the more timely the information, the worse your decisions get. So all those things were taught about, we need information in real time, you know, you got to be careful because the way we react to that information can lead us to bad places. So I don't even know what I'll say at 5.30. I don't even know what they'll ask me, you know, but you know, you'll find out because if I say something incredibly stupid, it's going to be recorded on YouTube and played over and over back to me at least, you know, and you'll hear about it. Yes? Yes. 
It could be, it could be that the fear is actually a real fear that every crisis could be the crisis, right? I mean, maybe what we call the fear factor is people reacting and saying this could be it, and then two or four weeks later stepping back and saying this wasn't it, right? So maybe, I didn't say it was irrational. That's why I would not use the word irrational or crazy because it is rational, okay? In fact, uh, for, for those of you who haven't had a chance to op open my implied equity risk premium spreadsheet, this evening would be a good day to open it up, enter the S&P 500, because you know what happened to T-bond rates today, right? Guess which direction they go? They fall. The T-bond rate now is 1.3%. So stocks are down, T-bond rates are down. The problem is the cash flow and growth numbers I can't get an update on because that's going to be a lag number. So right now, if you leave those fixed, I'll predict what's, what you're going to find. You're going to find an implied equity risk premium much higher than it was at the start of the month. I've worked it out, but I'm going to let you work it out. But we're probably overestimating the implied equity risk premium. Do you see why? Because we're not factoring in the cash flow and the earnings effects. Those are going to start to roll in. You know, already, Apple sent out that disclosure that their revenue you know, guidance is going to be down. I would expect to see this play out. But if that's all you have is earnings for the first quarter down, then you, you're pretty much, it's not the problem. But if that drop in earnings then translates to companies announcing that they're going to pull back from buybacks they've already announced, then we're starting to see a melting down of the implied equity risk premium. So right, for the moment, be afraid, but don't freak out. But be ready to freak out. Have all your codes packed in a suitcase, so you're ready to run if it happens. But that should always be your attitude with equities. If you're ever completely comfortable with where markets are, you should be terrified. Because equities are risky for a reason. They lull you into a false sense of complacency and then kick you in the face. Um, and you've got to be ready. This is a kick in the face. But after all of what happened today, guess where the S&P 500 is at? Where it was at the start of the year. Sometimes perspective matters, right? Everything looks like it's ended. If you compare it to a week ago, if you compare it to two months ago, you're saying that's not bad. So that's something also you need is perspective. And it's very difficult when you're in the middle of something like this to step back and have perspective. So today we're going to talk about betas. Those of you in my corporate finance class pretty much know where we're going. But one of the things I'm going to argue for is regression betas are a terrible way to estimate the beta for a company. Why? It's one slice of history. It's a statistical number, and it is a big standard error. So today I'm going to argue that we should replace regression betas with something more reliable. Specifically, what I'm going to call a bottom-up beta. Sounds fancy, but a beta computed by looking at comparable firms. Okay? So let me start with a question. When we estimate bottom-up betas, we need to use comparable firms. And I'm, my question is a pure m m measurement question. What companies should I count as comparable? And I'll give you the choices. Maybe you can look for a small sample of companies that look just like yours. So if you're a large US steel company, you look for other large US steel companies. So you might get a sample of four or five or six companies. Maybe you can look for a large sample of companies that might not be quite like yours, but you get you know, all steel companies, global steel companies. Or maybe you will find one company just like yours. So you look for a twin. Which of those choices is best if you're estimating bottom-up beta? We'll come back and ask the same question when we talk about PE ratios and pricing. But in the context of estimating betas, do you want a large sample of companies that may be different from yours, a smaller sample of companies that are more like yours, or one company exactly like yours? Anybody? Why do we use bottom-up beta? Somebody remind me again. What is the, when we use a single regression beta, one slice of history of a big standard error, we use bottom-up betas because we believe in the law of large numbers. You know what that means? You have a lot of companies. You screw up in each beta. When you average it out, the average is more precise than any one beta. And what does the law of, law of large numbers require? Large numbers. I think I've kind of answered the question, which is I would rather have 50 companies that are, you know, that have differences from yours and five. This is actually something you can see play out in S&P Capital IQ when you get on. And again, that's a kind of a nudge if you haven't, you know, got the okay and got on. Because let's say you want to look for betas for, you know, comparable companies. You can actually put in screens. You can say, I want 
all steel companies and you will get about 650 you say that's a big sample I won't want steel companies only in developed markets and you can pick the geographies and say I want steel companies in the developed markets with market caps greater than a billion and with each screen you will lose companies and if you're going from 650 to 50 I'm okay but if you're going from 650 to 5 you might want to go back and revisit the screen so the nice thing capital IQ is you can remove a screen and see what it does so you can kind of Work with the screens till you find some that deliver enough companies. How much is enough? You get up to 20, 25, 30. You're pretty much safe. So one beyond that, it's overkill to get to 25 to 600. So make that choice and reflect the trade-offs. And this second question is a related question. So when you're looking for those comparable firms, should it be a company in the same industry? Should it be a company with a similar market gap? Should it be a company in the same market? U.S. stock, U.S. stock. None of the above, all of the above. And I think the first question kind of answers the second one. The more criteria you add, the better your sample is in terms of comparability, but the smaller your sample becomes. There are some sectors where you can add in multiple criteria and you're going to be okay. Retail companies in the U.S. You can add five criteria. And because you started with 700 companies, you can still end up with 50. But you try this with aerospace companies, you're going to be in serious trouble because you start off with a sample of 30 and you start adding criteria, you're very quickly going to end up with a sample of two or three. So again, there is no right answer until you look at the data. The key is to look at the data and make the judgment. Let's finish this process. Today we're also perhaps going to start on the cost of debt. Okay. And I'll give you a preview. The cost of debt in the cost of capital calculation is the rate at which you can borrow money long term today. Two keywords are long term and today. File that away because here's my question. You have a company which has a billion dollars in bank loans outstanding, which it took a few years ago. The interest rate is 4%. It's a remaining maturity of eight years. So two years ago, you took a 10-year loan. The interest rate was set at 4%. The loans, uh, the current risk-free rate is 5%, and you anticipate that your default spread, if you borrowed money today, would be 2%. So I've kind of given you two choices. Do you want to go with the book interest rate? You've locked it in for the next eight years of 4%. Should you go with the market interest rate, which will be closer to 7%? Should you do what some people do when they're uncertain, split the difference, 7 plus 4 divided by 2, 5.5%. Yeah. Or should you just say, look, I won't use any number lower than the risk-free rate. You just use the risk-free rate as your bond. You kind of know what the right answer will be in every corporate finance and valuation textbook, right? What's the right answer? Always use the 7%. It's the rate at which you can borrow money today. You know how much of a fight this is going to be when you present it to a company? Because you know what the pushback you will get is, but I have all this debt at 4%. Why are you charging a 7% cost? It seems unfair. So explain to me as a not so bright CFO why 7% is my cost of debt, not 4%. Go ahead. Because if you want to do Okay, but why don't you give me the benefit of the existing borrowing I have? This seems un so on the next borrowing, you want to put a 7%. If I want to go borrow a next half a billion, you say it's 7%. I'm okay with it. Why are you attaching it to the existing billion dollars in debt? Because that's what I'm doing in a cost of capital, right? Anybody else? Yes. But you know why I made myself CFO, right? What does CFOs think of? What does it cost me to borrow money? What does it cost me to raise equity? And my reasoning is I've already borrowed the money. I know what the cost is. As long as I make more than that cost, am I not creating value? That's really it, right? That's what, and I think that's the opening you have to use. Play a game. Let's assume that you take a project entirely funded with this debt you already have. What's the cost of that debt? 4%, right? So if that project makes 4.5%, by your definition of cost of debt, you should take it. Do you see what you've just now done? You've taken a project with a 4.5% return. The risk-free rate is 5%. You could have put your money in T-bonds and made 
investing is about opportunity sets today, not opportunity sets two years ago. So I'm just rephrasing what you said in terms of how corporate finance has to think about it, is even if you have a lot of cheap debt on your books, it's a nice thing to have. I'm not saying I'm not going to give, you know what I'm going to give you the advantage? is when I actually compute your interest coverage ratio and your ratings, I'm going to give you a much higher rating than you should have because you've locked in the debt. But I'm saying when you take projects today, when you value your opportunities today, it has to be based on what you can borrow money today. Okay? Half of all companies around the world compute their cost of capital using what's called a book interest rate. A book interest rate is computed by taking the interest expense divided by the book value of debt, which is a 4%. Half of all companies use this rationale. I've already locked in the debt. Why are you bugging me about this new cost of debt? And the answer always has to be to lead them through the consequences of using that cost of debt and the cost of capital and the kinds of perverse decisions it leads to. And one, one other thing, this, this, this um, not only should I be using a market cost of debt in my cost of capital, but the debt ratio in my cost of capital is supposed to be a market debt ratio. But remember, these loans are not traded. So the defense I would offer is they're not traded. Therefore, the bill. So let's assume this company has a billion dollar market cap, market value of equity. I told you that it is a bank loan for a billion, right? With a 4% interest rate. If you are computing the debt ratio for this company, would the debt ratio be 50%, which is what it looks like, billion dollars in debt and billion dollars of equity? Would it be less than 50% or more than 50%? You think it'll be more than 50%? Tell me why. You're actually right. Tell me why it would be. Because the value of the debt is higher, so it's a low-cost debt. In fact, remember the bond example that you gave? If this had been a bond with a coupon rate of 4%, let's leave this true. You're, it'll be less than a billion dollar value or more than a billion dollar value? It'll be less than a billion dollar value? Think about that, coupon rate is 4%, market interest rate is 7%, what happens to the price of a bond when the interest rate is higher than the coupon rate? The market value of the debt is going to be less than a billion dollars, which means the debt ratio, if I'm looking at the debt ratio, would be less than 50% because that debt, it's locked in at 4%, market interest rates have gone up, the market value of the debt will have to be less than the book value. That is the opening we're going to use today to convert book debt to market debt. We're going to treat it like a huge bond. We're going to treat the interest expense like a coupon. And then we're going to compute the present value. And then we no longer have the excuse, it's not traded, therefore I'm going to use the book value. Because especially when companies get distressed and we leave the book debt at where it is, we're going to get absurdly low cost of capital for these companies because the debt will be 90% of the company. And you're, in a sense, overestimating how much of the value is actually coming from that. Incidentally, when you compute enterprise value, you are supposed to take market value of equity plus market value of debt minus cash, and people use book value of debt because they can't get the market value. They're routinely overestimating the enterprise value of troubled companies because the book value of debt will be much higher than the market value of debt. So even though debt is not traded, it doesn't mean you can't estimate a market value. So ready? We're going to go. To, we're going to start today with the, with with betas, and then. We're going to see where that leads us in terms of cost of capital. So we've all seen the beta lecture, right? You saw it in foundations. Anybody who's taken a finance class, including me, we are taught that betas come from running a regression. Returns in the stock against returns in the market index, the slope of the line is the beta. It's a terrible way to think about betas. Because what does it do? It makes it into a statistical number, something that comes from a regression. But I'm going to argue that not only is it a terrible way to think about betas, it's a terrible way to estimate betas for three reasons. One is, whenever you run a regression in statistics and you report the output from the regression, we report below the coefficients either the standard error or the t-statistic, telling the world, look, we ran the regression, this is the slope, oh, by the way, we could be wrong. This is how wrong we can be. We're going to start off with that problem with regression betas. When you run a regression beta, you can get a very big standard error, which means the range on your beta can be large. Second, a regression by definition is backward looking, right? Because I've run returns in the last three years, the last five years, not the next five. And to the extent that my company is changing its business mix, even if the regression beta were right, it's not going to be the beta I should be using going forward. 
And third, it reflects what the company used to use as its leverage during the period of the regression. What sense? Let's say for the last five years, your company had absolutely no debt. And yesterday, they went out and borrowed $15 billion. A regression can't re show that, right? Because it looks at the returns over the last five years. So even if you trust regression betas to be right for those last five years, they might not be the betas you should use for the future. So let me build my case using actual pages right out of Bloomberg. So because with each one, I can make the case for each of the things I talked about. One is I could run a regression beta. And in Bloomberg, one of the th nice things is the raw beta is always the regression beta. The adjusted beta, if you remember, is just the raw beta moved towards one. There's nothing adjusted about it, just a word that they use to make it sound like they're adjusting for things. It's, it's always the same adjustment. But if you keep going down, it says standard error of the beta. This is the regression beta for GoPro. Remember GoPro? The camera for overactive oversharers. <laughs> it basically strapped it onto your head. You went on a 15-mile hike. You acted like I was interested in every mile that you walked. So five hours of video come on on how much you saw on your walk, which is pretty much nothing. Okay. But for a while, it was a high rising stock, and a stock doubled, tripled. So I ran a regression beta, and this was during its good days. I got a regression beta 1.6. So you're saying, that's good. But before you get too excited, the standard error in that beta is 0.50. If you remember, if you go back to statistics, if I say the regression beta is 1.60, and the standard error is 0 0.5, I've effectively told you that even if this regression is right, the true beta could be anywhere from 0 0.6 to 2.6, plus or minus two standard errors. That's what I mean by noisy. You're saying, what if my regression beta looks really good? Then you should be really, really scared. Because usually with European companies, you will get much better looking regression betas than with US companies. And this is an extreme case of a European company, Nokia in 2000. Why extreme? Because Bloomberg is very parochial about estimating how it estimates betas. You ask for the beta for a German company, it runs it against the DAX. An Indian company against the Sensex. A US company against the S&P 500. For Nokia, it ran it against the HEX, which is the Helsinki Exchange. Why? Because Nokia is a Finnish company. It ran it. You're saying, so what? At the time that I ran this regression, Nokia was 80% of the index. So you're essentially getting a regression of Nokia against Nokia. Of course, the R squared is really high. But it means absolutely nothing, because beta measures the risk to the marginal investor in a company. And that marginal investor in Nokia happened to be Barclays as part of their global index fund. Who the heck cares how Nokia moves with the hex? So when, you shouldn't trust regression betas when they're noisy, and you shouldn't trust them when they're precise. You kind of see where my biases are going to lead me. Okay? And if I let you look at any slice of history, you can get strange looking results. For instance. This was a regression beta that I ran for Valiant. Valiant, as you remember, is a ph Canadian pharmaceutical company that had a very difficult business model to defend in a public domain. What was its business model? To its acquisitions of companies with underpriced drugs. Let that kind of swirl around in your head. What are underpriced drugs? These are drugs which are still under patent which people need because they have a particular disease, but they're being priced too low. I let you fill in what the rest of their business model was. It was not quite Martin Tricelli, the crazy guy who bought the, you know, the drug for, and then increased, but it was a, basically they'd buy drugs which would be $10 a month and increase the drug price to $100 a month. Okay. Why? Because this is a drug you absolutely needed. And at some point, the business model fell apart because this is, I think, a case where he will cross that line for social responsibility. There's a point at which the whole thing blows up, the model blows up. So this was after the stock had gone on, it basically had collapsed. One of the most highly held stocks among the I have no idea what that means, and I really don't want to know. Okay? <laughs> So this was one of the most highly held stocks among value investors, old time value investors. They loved the company. Bill Ackman was one of the lead investors, the activist investor who pushed the company. The model falls apart, the stock price collapses. Stock price is down 80%. Let me ask you a question. Stock price collapses 80%, the company's business model is broken, and I ask you how risky is this company? What's your first reaction? It's very risky, right? So I ran a regression beta, and the regression beta said the stock was almost riskless, 0.36. Now, 
how do you explain the fact that you have a stock collapsing and you get a really low beta? Incidentally, if you run a regression beta for Tesla right now, you get a really low beta too. Why would Tesla, where the stock price has zoomed over the last year, and um, Valiant, where the stock price has collapsed, have low betas? Basically, remember, betas measure how you move with the market. If you have a stock that drops every day, terrible things keep happening to it, no matter what the market's doing, it might be risky, but it's not going to show a high beta because it's not moving with the market. Same thing is true. If you have a stock that keeps rising, no matter what's happening in the market, its beta will drop. You think that's terrible. It is, any time you take one slice of history, this could happen, right? You take a two-year regression period, all you need is an acquisition attempt on your company, and all of a sudden your beta will collapse. So betas are noisy, and when they're not, you should be really worried about the index. And betas are affected by the fact you're one slice of history. Which brings me to my final critique of betas. Today, you can run regression, if, especially if you have access to a Bloomberg, you can change the index, you can go from the local listing to the ADR. This is actually two beta calculations are printed for Bombardier. Bombardier is the Canadian aeros, you know, aerospace company with lots of problems. Um, I ran a regression of Bombardier against a Canadian exchange, and then I ran a regression of Bombardier's ADR versus the S&P 500. You're saying, which one should I trust? I wouldn't trust either. They're both incredibly noisy estimates, but if you, can, you can see already we talked about bias in the first few sessions, how if you have bias, this now becomes a vehicle for you to play around till you get a beta that best reflects your bias. Okay. So when you look at a regression beta, especially if it says, look, there's the Bloomberg beta. Don't let them get away with it. Ask them the question, how many beta pages did you try before you printed this one? They will lie. The reality is you can make any company have any beta pretty much by playing with the starting point, the ending point, the index, weekly, daily, monthly. There are so many degrees of freedom you can get that your beta can move around. So let me take a pause right there. Anytime you use betas though, you are making the assumption that the margin investor is diversified and you can measure that risk with this price-based regression, right? So in about three and a half months, I'll have to go to Omaha to talk to portfolio managers in the value investing. And one of the things they will tell me is how much they dislike betas. In fact, they will tell me that they don't do discounted cash flow valuation because they don't like betas. No, seriously, that is actually the biggest reason many value investors give for not doing discounted cash flow valuation. I don't like betas. So I'm going to ask, so for those of you who are skeptical about betas, and you should be, I am skeptical about betas, Here's my first question. What is it that you don't like about betas? Because there are two critiques you can give of betas. One is the assumption the margin investor is diversified. You're saying, what if I'm working in a market where investors are not diversified? That's one critique. The second is that I'm estimating a beta using price-based numbers, right? You're saying, what's wrong with that? Remember, if you're a true intrinsic value investor, what do you say about markets? I don't trust markets, right? And then I'm using a market price-based measure of risk. You're saying, Hey, I don't want that market price based measure because I don't trust markets. So let's carry this through. If you tell me that you're okay with the margin investors being diversified, you're okay with that argument, but you do not like price based measures, then I can give you alternatives. Like what? Have you ever heard of an accounting beta? In accounting beta, what you do is instead of taking the change in stock price from day to day and running a regression against change in the index, you take the change in earnings at your company on a quarterly basis. Obviously, you can't do it on a daily basis, maybe for the last 10 years. And you take the change in earnings for the S&P 500, you run a regression just like you did with prices. Called an accounting beta, but you've replaced stock prices with earnings, and because you don't like prices, I'll give you that. The second is actually a very rule of thumb approach, where if you can tell me what your cost of debt is as a company, I use an intuitive rationale. If it costs you 8% to borrow money, the equity investor is behind you, so I'm going to come up with 12%. In fact, there are some, some people who just come up with a scalar, 1.5 times cost of debt. But essentially, they're saying, look, I don't trust price-based measures. I'm going to use the cost of debt, which is an observable number, to come up with that. So that's if you don't like prices. If you like prices, then all of the risk and return models and finance come into play. You can use the CAPM if you want to make the assumption of supreme diversification in one market portfolio, the arbitrage pricing model, the multi-factor, but everything in finance is built on the premise that you trust both the market, the marginal investor being diversified and trust prices.
if you say, look, you don't believe margin investors are diversified, then I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you still trust price-based measures? If you trust price-based measures, I can come up with other measures of risk that look just like a beta, but without making the assumption of the marginal investor being diversified. So for instance, when I do betas, here's how I compute a beta. I compute the covariance of your stock with the market, the portion of your variance that you cannot diversify away. That's what betas are based on. But now you've told me that you don't think investors are diversified. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the total variance of the total standard deviation. So let's play along. Let's assume you tell me that the standard deviation in Tesla stock price for the last five years has been 50%. The average standard deviation for a U.S. stock is about 32%. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to divide the 50 by the 32. I'm going to come up with a number that looks just like a beta, but rather than focusing on just the risk that I cannot diversify, it's a total risk measure. It's a price-based measure, but based on relative standard deviation. I can use proxy models. What are proxy models? You tell me what kind of company you are. You're a small company with a low price to book ratio. I can look at what small companies are earning as returns and attach that to you. Again, I'm using no approaches, no assumptions about it. And you can also use what I call cap and plus. What are cap and plus models? Here's how a lot of people estimate cost of equity for a company. They'll start risk-free rate plus beta times equity risk premium but then they'll add a small cap premium. And basically premiums for things that they think the cap M has missed essentially to bring in the rest of the risk. So if you don't believe in diversification, um, in price-based measures, I can give you, you know, ways in which, or you believe in price-based, but you don't believe in diversification, I can give you ways of measuring relative risk based on total standard deviation. If you don't believe in both assumptions, you believe marginal investors are not diversified and you don't believe in price-based measures, then you're really stuck with what accountants tell you. You must trust accountants a lot more than I do because then you have to focus entirely on accounting numbers. What I'm trying to say is don't let people say, I don't like betas and win the argument right there. Here's what you should say. When they say, I don't like betas, you say, I don't like betas either. So what would you like me to use instead? It's amazing how quickly the discussion will come back to earth when you say, what will you use, like me to use instead? Because the answers you will get would range from the spectacularly bad to I really don't know. I really don't know doesn't beat a model. Or they would say, look, oh, you use 10% for every company. In which case, the question you've got to ask is why, so you're saying I should use 10% for a GoPro and a Kraft Heinz? I mean, kind of push their model because it is very easy to show that the CAPM doesn't work. And in academia, actually, we've dug the hole for the CAPM. For 35 years, we've talked about all the things that CAPM doesn't do right. That's where the proxy models came from. But we still go back to the cap M because fundamentally the model kind of holds on there because the competition tends to be so bad. So don't abandon discounted cash flow models just because you don't like the cap M, you don't like modern portfolio theory. Find a way to come up with a measure of risk that looks like a beta. You know what I mean by looks like a beta? You want the average stock to have a beta like you know, a relative risk measure of one whether you use accounting earnings or whether you use stock price, whatever you decide to use. Put that in instead of betas, move on. Don't make this your last stand because it's not really your last stand. Any questions about betas and alternatives? So now let's, uh, and in fact I know with accounting risk measures, you can actually with capital IQ download all kinds of accounting risk measures. You can measure, you know, there are some people who use debt ratios as their proxy for risk. There's the more debt you have, the riskier you are as a company. If that's what you believe best measures risk, I'll go along. There's some people who use numerical scores. One is safe, five is risky, and come up with different rates of return. If that's how you want to think about risk, all I need is a discount rate that reflects risk. And I will go along with whatever your definition of risk is, as long as I can move on to the cash flows, the growth rates, the, the numbers in the numerator. Okay? Which brings me back to the old term. If I don't like regression betas, what should I do instead? The page you saw in corporate finance, might as well revisit the page. Ultimately, your beta as a company does not come from regressions. It doesn't come from Bloomberg. It comes from choices you make as a company. About what? First, tell me what business you've entered. Cyclical companies should have higher betas than non-cyclical companies. Because remember, beta measures how you move with the market. Housing stocks, automobile stocks should have higher betas than food processing companies. 
But I'll give you another line of, of, of differentiating across companies. The more, the more discriminating your customers can be, the more, the more they can put off buying your products and services if they don't have the money today. The more they can delay or defer buying it, the higher beta should be. In fact, the way to think about this is if you think about how discretionary, it's, it's elasticity of demand. Am I producing something that people have to buy, in which case your beta will be low, or am I producing something that people can put off buying? So tobacco companies, maybe even cannabis stocks, should end up with much lower betas than you know, luxury retail. The more you need to have your product right now, the lower your beta should be as a company. So in fact, my suggestion is take the retail sector, right, and think about the breakdown of the retail sector. You can have luxury retail, department stores, discount retail, food, pro food grocery stores, all in the mix. And think about how this would fall. The luxury retailers will have the highest betas, then department stores, then discount retailers, and then grocery stores. So that's the first stop. Tell me what you do as a, as a business, and I can start to guess whether you should have a lower or a high beta. Second stop, tell me something about your cost structure. The greater the proportion of your costs that are fixed costs as a company, the higher your beta will be as a company. And think of why. When you have a lot of fixed costs, good times will look great and bad times will look terrible. Everything gets magnified. So businesses with high fixed costs, like airlines, big infrastructure companies, should have much higher betas than businesses with low fixed costs. And finally, as you borrow money, you create a fixed cost you do not have until you borrow the money, which is interest expenses. You've got to make them in good times, you've got to make them in bad times. When you borrow money, you make your equity beta higher by magnifying the impact of everything that happens to you. Ultimately, your beta as a company depends on how those three questions get answered. How discretionary is your product or service? How much are your fixed costs? How much have you borrowed? Question. What about negative betas? What about negative betas? Actually, in fact, many of you will, I hope, get jobs after the MBA. You know, I, I'm assuming it's a period. And then you'll be back to inflict punishment on the next generation of aspiring when you interview people. It's a great question. Can betas be negative? What's the answer to that? Yes? In fact, remember that real estate example we saw where the risk premium was negative, and what was the argument? Adding real estate to a portfolio in the 1980s made your overall portfolio less risky. So when you have a negative beta company, you're buying insurance against some big macro variable. Gold mining stocks used to be viewed as negative beta stocks. Why? Because if your assets were primarily financial assets, Adding gold mining stocks actually insured you against inflation, which is deadly. So can you have negative beta stocks? Yes. Will you see them? Very unlikely. For two reasons. There are very few sectors that are truly negatively correlated with the economy. Okay, funeral homes, maybe, you know. But you know, how many of you are doing funeral homes? No. No. But basically, there are very few sectors we can reason through. Which means if you're looking at a company in a sector, you're almost always going to end up with low to high betas. But you could end up with negative betas if you pick a really strange sector. But it's, an ins it's something. In you're insuring against something. Yeah? Yes? Won't fixed costs only matter so much with high beta products? Because if the product itself is a low beta, then any fixed cost of all... You've actually reasoned your way to why some companies can get away with high debt ratios. For instance, regulated utilities have really high debt ratios. Why were they able to get away with it? Because they're revenue bound. So it's still the same effect, but since the, the, the variance is low, the effect, it's, it doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect, but the effect is nullified. So if you're a company with low variance in, all, in, in revenues and operating income, you can afford to borrow a lot of money, not because it doesn't affect your beta, but the unlevered beta, the beta you start with for your business, is so low that adding that fixed cost structure is not going to hurt it. You know what's going to kill energy companies? If energy becomes deregulated, their basic business, this is what killed the cable companies, right? And the phone companies before them, they used to be monopolies. They used to borrow money to the, to the hilt. And then the business became a technology business that was comparative. And they still kept the debt ratios at 60, 70, 80%. So you're absolutely right. If you have an underlying business that's stable and predictable, you can afford to have lots of fixed costs and lots of debt and get away with it. And that's why the traditional utilities were able to do both. They had high fixed costs and high debt. But if your underlying business becomes more, it's a multiplier effect. That's basically what it is. Yes? Yes? 
<laughs> Absolutely. Not so much to the CPI, but correlated to things that are happening in the economy. I'll give you an example. I've been computing bottom-up betas by sector going back to the 1990s. The bottom-up beta for banks in 2007 used to be like 0.85. This is the levered beta. The bottom-up beta for banks by the time you got to 2010 was closer to 1.2. What changed? You had the crisis. It affected the risk of banks. So basically, you see sector. That's why on my website, I've started reporting in addition to the beta by sector a five-year average. Because you can get jumps happening. Sometimes purely, if you have a smaller sample like railroads last year, I did 2.04 beta. And I remember getting emails saying, what the hell happened here? I said, no, I, no, I, just the numbers. That's basically all, all, all I, I'm doing. But that number is probably too high. Why don't you use a five-year average? But sometimes you can get shifts in the economy that make companies less or more risky over time. Right? So. Yeah, it's because industry-specific beta is correlated with industry average returns, right? So basically, you're, and industry average returns are affected by macroeconomic variables, right? The, if you have a bad economic cycle, you're going to see housing and automobiles. So that relation applies, and that's why when you attach industry betas, you're going back to macroeconomic sources. That's why you feel more comfortable than run, running one regression of the stock and getting strange numbers. Right? But that's your objective, is to wipe out the company-specific component in your regression and go back to the source risk. So in a perfect world, here's how I'd estimate betas. I'd start by estimating a beta for the business based on the revenue variable in the kinds of flip. The second stop, I will attach an operating leverage adjustment because maybe you're a company which has much higher or much lower operating leverage than the typical company in your sector. And the third step in the process is I'll bring in financial leverage. So think of the first step as giving you a kind of business unlevered beta, kind of a pure unlevered beta. The second step is giving you the unlevered beta of the business with the fixed cost brought in. And the third step is bringing in the debt ratio effect. And I'll tell you why I almost never adjust for operating leverage, even though I talk about it. To adjust for operating leverage, I need to know how much of your costs are fixed and how much are variable, right? I challenge you to open up the income statement for a company and try to back these numbers out because accounting doesn't break expenses down into fixed and variable. It breaks it down to cost of goods sold. And you can try to guess and say, oh, maybe R&D is variable, maybe SGNA is fixed, but you're completely guessing. The biggest challenge for adjusting beta for operating leverage is not that we don't know how to do it. It's we don't have the data. Because the adjustment for operating leverage looks just like the unlevered beta, levered beta equation, but with fixed cost and variable cost replacing debt and equity. So basically, if you could give me a sector of 50 companies and break down fixed and variable costs for every company, I can give you an unlevered beta before fixed costs, and then you could adjust for your company's specific fixed cost ratio and tell me this is what the beta should be. So, Unless you're a true outlier company, and I give the example of Southwest in the airline business, much lower fixed costs because they, by design, built a business with more flexible cost structures. Maybe it's worth going through this effort. But for most companies, you can see already why we do what we do. You give me a steel company, I use the unlevered beta for steel companies. Implicitly, I'm assuming your fixed cost structure is going to be driven by the steel business. But if somebody gives you a hard time of saying you should be adjusting fixed costs, you know what you should do? Ask them to come back with fixed and variable costs for every company in the sector and say, I can do it. It's not that we don't know how to do it. The information is just not there. And finally, with financial leverage, most of you have seen the traditional levered beta equation. In fact, in a corporate finance class, I made use it over and over again. The levered beta for a stock is the unlevered beta. The unlevered beta reflects both the business you're in and your fixed cost structure. Your leverage is captured in a debt to equity ratio. And as I said, as your debt to equity ratio rises, your levered beta will go up. The intuition is simple. Basically, we have fewer and fewer equity investors in a the company. They're going to bear more and more of the risk because the lenders are bearing none of the risk. And implicit in that assumption, in, in that equation, is an assumption that the beta for debt is zero. You're saying, what does that mean? I'm not saying debt is riskless. I'm saying debt has no market risk. That what happens to debt has nothing to do with the market. 
And if you have a triple A or a triple B rated company, you could probably get away with that assumption because what's happening is happening outside there. And you could say, look, you know, I, I, I'm just going to assume the beta of debt is zero. But if you have a company with 60, 70, 80% debt and its debt has become junk, no, single B, triple C. If you've ever tracked junk debt, junk debt behaves more like equity than debt. It's driven by more, more. There you could argue that this assumption is going to get you into trouble. So what can you do? If, you really, if it really worries you, and it's never worried me, but if this is something you get obsessed about, is the beta of debt is not zero, there is an expanded version of the levered beta equation where if you can give me the beta of debt, I can adjust your beta equity. And here's what it'll do. At very high debt ratios, it'll lower the beta for your equity because the, the debt holders are now bearing some of the risk. Intuitively, I'm making the lenders bear some of my market risk as I get to more and more levered status. So if you remember the cost of capital calculations, the cost of equity kept rising dramatically. Your beta gets to 9, 9.5, 10 with very high debt ratios. If you use this adjusted formula, the beta of debt equity will never get that high because the lenders will start to bear some of that risk. It doesn't overall affect your cost to capital that much, and that's why I don't bother as much. But if you really, again, I just want to equip you with those people who are pains in the neck about small things like this. They want to make this their stat. Your levered beta equation assumes beta of debt is zero. That's wrong. Okay, you're right. It's wrong. But if you want me to use the full formula, tell me how to estimate the beta of debt. Because if you don't, they'll use that as an argument for you shouldn't lever betas. So it's not, again, that we don't know how to adjust for the beta of debt. It's getting the beta of debt is much more messy than getting the beta of equity. So now we're ready to, do, to set up the process. To get a bottom-up beta for a company, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with the business of businesses you're in as a company. Okay? I'm going to find as many publicly traded companies as I can for each, in each of these businesses. As many because the law of large numbers requires large numbers. I'm going to get the regression beta for each of these companies. And I'm also going to collect the debt to equity ratios for each of these companies. Why? Because those regression betas are levered betas. I want to clean up for the debt effect. I'm going to take the average regression beta and the debt to equity ratio of the sector. You're saying, why don't you do an unlevered beta for each one? You could. Technically, there's no reason why you shouldn't. But statistically, I think it's better to average first and then do all your calculations. So I'm going to take the average beta for the sector and clean up that average beta for the average debt to equity ratio for the sector. I'm going to end up with an unlevered beta for the sector. So basically, let's say you're in two businesses, steel and chemicals. I come up with an unlevered beta for steel and an unlevered beta for chemicals. In step three, I come back to you and say, hey, you, you know what? Can you tell me how much value you get from each business? And you might say, look, I don't know how much value I get, but I can tell you how much revenues I get. 60% from steel, 40% from chemicals. And if I'm in a hurry, I'll take that weighted average. If I'm not in a hurry, I'm going to try to find a way to figure out whether I can change those revenues into estimated value. Use those weights to come up with an unlevered beta for your company. And then I'm going to ask you a final question. Do you have any debt? And if you say no, I'm done, because then your unlevered beta is your levered beta. But if you do have debt, I'm going to compute your debt to equity ratio and use it to come up with a levered beta. Why am I doing all of this? Because I don't like regression betas, right? But where did I get the steel company betas and the chemical company betas? I got them from regressions. All I've done is replace one with an average of 50. That's why I said the entire argument is premised on the law of large numbers working for you. Because when I do that, remember that big standard area you saw for GoPro's beta? If I found 50 companies like GoPro, young, money-losing, high-growth companies, each of their betas will be crappy, but the average of the 50 betas is magically precise. It's a law of large numbers working in your favor. So the arguments for bottom-up betas are pretty straightforward. It's first, more precise. Why? Because you have large numbers working for you. Second, the bottom-up beta can reflect the business mix you have today, not the business mix you used to have. So if you entered the chemical business yesterday, I can reflect that in your beta. I can even be proactive. You say you're going to be in the technology business tomorrow, I can bring that into play. And guess what? If you come to me with a private company that's on the verge of going public, Casper three weeks ago, if the only way you can get a beta is run a regression, you are completely and totally sunk, right? You can go to Bloomberg, type in the word Casper as many times as you want. There will be, it'll give you a blank page. Bloomberg actually is very dumb in that way. It'll just show you a page with no points on it, say, I don't know why, but we can't estimate a regression beta. 
I'll tell you why. There are no points on the graph, right? But basically, you can't get a regression beta. But I can get a bottom-up beta. I have to decide what business Casper is in, whether it's in the sleep business as it claims to be, or the mattress business. But that really becomes a way in which I can estimate betas for pretty much any company. Right? Now, if you remember in corporate finance, one of the companies we looked at was Vale. Brazilian mining company, which gets a big chunk of its revenues in. 37% of its revenues. Remember? Remember you know the answer. Anytime you don't know the answer, just give this. China. Right? Brazilian mining company, big chunk of its revenues in China. I wanted to value Vale, so I looked at the businesses they were in. And usually when you want to see what businesses your company is in, don't try to make yourself a rocket scientist. to start with the annual report. This is Vale's breakdown of businesses. They're in metals and mining, iron ore, fertilizers, and logistics. They gave me the revenues that they had in each business. I went and looked up publicly traded companies in each of these businesses. And here my choice is very simple. It's a global company. I'm not going to stay with just Brazilian companies or Latin American companies. So I looked at global companies in each of these groups. And they have pretty solid sample sizes. In fact, some for the fertilizer and logistics are huge. I looked at the unlevered beta by looking at the regression betas for these companies. I could have weighted by revenues, but I took one additional step. And here's what I did. I said a dollar in revenue in the logistics business is not worth as much as a dollar in revenue in the iron ore business because margins tend to be smaller. And one of the numbers I got by looking at the comparable firms was the multiple of revenues that companies in this business trade at. So the way to read this is a typical metals and mining company trades at about 1.97 times revenues. Typical iron ore company trades at 2.5 times revenues. I multiplied the revenue by that multiple. Basically, I'm trying to estimate value. Those estimated values give me weights. And based on my assessments, the weights that I see for Vale is 76% of iron ore, about 17% metals and mining, 5% for fertilizers, and about 1.8% for logistics. Some obviously should add up to 100%. And I take the weighted average. What I get is a weighted average of 0.844 is my unlevered beta for Vale. So it's a process of breaking companies down, getting the betas by business, and taking a weighted average. The most tedious part of this is you have to do it from scratch, is getting the betas. But if you're using capital IQ, that's really not even that tedious, right? You're just doing this, the kind of screening to get it. In the old days, you had to collect by hand. You could have complained about it, but today you don't even have that complaint. And to get a levered beta, I applied the same debt to equity ratio for all of their businesses. Yes? for doing the levered beta. It's just the algebra. So if you set up a, the way the, the, the original levered beta equation was set up is you have, you know, uh, on the asset side of the balance sheet, you have the assets of the company. On the liability side, you have debt and equity. So you attach a beta of debt of zero to the debt side and the unlevered beta. So you just basically, if you set up that equation and work through the algebra, it turns out that the debt to equity ratio is what comes out of the, because the weighted average beta of the asset side has to be equal to the weighted average beta of the liability side. Okay. So set up the equation and solve through the debt to equity. And remember, the debt to equity ratio and the debt to cap are perfectly correlated. The only reason we use the debt to equity is because algebraically, it's that multiplier effect that applies to the equity. Yeah, and in fact, that's exactly how equity should feel, right? So if you have $9 of equity for $1 of debt, you don't feel that you have only nine, you have nine times as much risk because in a sense, I keep Stop moving my hands so much. I keep loading up. So I'll give you a very simple example. Let's suppose you have 100 units of risk in a company, and you have 100 shares. You have no debt. Each shareholder bears one unit of risk, right? Let's say I take this company, borrow $90, and buy back 90 shares. So you now have 10 shares. The same 100 units of risk, the same company. Remember, the debt holders bear none of that risk. That's the implicit assumption. I ask you, how much risk do you feel? You take the 100 units divided by 10 shares, you, it's almost like you have a beta of 10, 10 times as much risk. That's what the debt to equity ratio is doing, is it's scaling up your equity risk as you become a smaller and smaller percentage of the company. So that's what the algebra does. It basically moves all the risk onto the equity investors. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, um, well, you, you were not in my corporate finance class, right? Remember Disney, we use different 
Debt, why did we use different debt to equity ratios for Disney? Because like some divisions have more debt. And we have a theme park business and a movie business. The debt to equity ratios are obvious. There I, and there the way I had to go through all, through all kinds of contortions to allocate the debt because Disney doesn't tell me where it borrows money for. But I went through that effort because I could see the business were different. You take all of these businesses, what do they share in common? They're all heavy infrastructure investing businesses. If, so if Vale had said they had a movie business in there, bad combination, then I'd have worked at what was the debt to equity ratio of the movie business. So it's pure laziness on, on the one part and the other looking at these businesses saying, eh, they probably have pretty similar debt ratios given the nature of these businesses. Yeah. You could, yeah, that's a good question because why not attach industry debt to equity ratios? Let's take a very limiting case. Let's suppose you have a company with absolutely no debt. Do you see what I'm saying? If you use industry averages, then you have a second test run to make sure that the sum of the debt you've created for this company actually matches up because we do know the debt to equity ratio for the whole company. So if you do industry averages, you then have to reallocate the debt in proportion to make sure your total debt ends up at 54.99%. So it's doable, but you've got to kind of make sure that you're not violating some base principle on how much debt they actually have. Any other questions? So let's try this for Embraer. Global aerospace company, the beta that I gave them was 0.95. And that unlevered beta came from looking at global aerospace companies everywhere. Not just Brazilian, because there's only one Brazilian aerospace company called Embraer. There's no other companies there. Not Latin America, not even emerging markets. And you know what? That makes sense to me, because in when Embraer goes out and sells aircraft, it's competing against Bombardier. And basically, it's, in the, it, it's a global company. So in this case, I'm using an unlevered beta by looking at global aerospace. For those of you familiar with my beta you know, that I report on my website, I report a beta for global averages, which is all 43,000 companies. I report a US beta, an emerging market beta, and it might look like I'm just hitting you with all these different estimates. Which one would I use? For a company like Embraer, I said I'd use the global. So I'm gonna ask you a, a kind of follow-up question. Can you imagine a scenario where you're sitting down to value a company you have both a global average and an emerging market average. And you go with the emerging market average. What kind of business would you use the emerging market average for instead of the global average? Go back to the drivers of betas. What do we say? How discretionary is your product or service? What's your fixed cost? What's your financial leverage? Are there some businesses that are non-discretionary in developed markets, but are discretionary in emerging markets. I can think of quite a few. Telecom in its early days was non-discretionary in developed markets because everybody had a phone. In the early days in emerging markets, depending on whether the country was growing fast or not, you might get you know, people buying phones or not buying phones. You could argue that if you're looking at a telecom company in emerging markets in 2006 or 2007, you'd have used the emerging market beta because it better reflects the discretionary nature of telecom in those businesses. So when you pick a company and you look at the business and it's an emerging market company to decide whether to use emerging market averages or global market averages, that might be one of the questions you want to ask. Is a brand name company in an emerging market, is it more risky than a brand name company in a developed market? because so much more of its revenues are discretionary. Okay. One final point before we leave this process. If, you know, I don't know how many, of you, how many of you worked in Europe or Latin America before you came back to business school? Okay. Do, you do you remember how debt ratios were computed when you were working? Were you working in finance? Okay. Anybody working in finance, do you remember how debt ratios were computed? The conventional practice in Europe and Latin America is to use net debt not gross debt. What's net debt? You take the debt and you subtract out the cash. Okay. When I did Embraer's levered beta calculation, I used the gross debt ratio, which was about 19%. I came up with the beta that reflect the gross debt ratio. However, Embraer's cash, and if I net out the cash, I actually end up with a net debt ratio that's negative. So let me pause right there. Instead of using the debt ratio that I had, with the growth, which was 19%, I'm now going to use a debt ratio of minus 3.32%. So help me out in the mechanics. I have the same unlevered beta, 
I'm now putting in a net debt to equity ratio of minus 3.32%. My levered beta is actually going to be lower than my unlevered beta. Don't freak out yet. But that's exactly what you should expect when you have a lot of cash overwhelming your debt. So with net debt ratios, I'll predict what's going to happen. You're going to end up with lower betas and lower costs of equity. But you know what? Your costs of capital might not be that different from my cost of capital. And here's why. When I did my gross debt ratio, I had a higher beta and a higher cost of equity, right? And then when I did cost of capital, I brought in the cost of debt, which is much lower than the cost of equity, and weighted it by the debt ratio, which in my gross debt calculations is 14 or 15 percent. When you do net debt ratios, your levered beta is low, your cost of equity is low, but when you compute your cost of capital, here's what you should see. That cost of equity will get multiplied by 103 percent and your cost of debt will be multiplied by minus 3%. You're saying, that makes no sense. You almost short-sold your company in a net debt ratio basis, but your overall cost of capital is going to be roughly the same as long as you stay consistent all the way through. What would get you into trouble is you use the net debt ratio to do your levered beta and use the gross debt ratio in your cost of capital. What will also get you into trouble is you arbitrarily putting floors on the net debt ratio. For instance, some people refuse to use less than 0%. If you go the net debt ratio route, you've got to go the entire distance. And if you go the entire distance, then I'm okay. I'm completely fine with your cost of capital because your cost of capital should be very similar to my cost of capital. So let's summarize what we have with the cost of equity. The risk-free rate should be in whatever currency you've chosen to do the analysis in. Easier in some currencies than others. The beta should be preferably a bottom-up beta that reflect the business or businesses your company is in and the leverage you've taken on. The equity risk premium, you can use a historical risk premium, but do so with caution. Or I, as I you know, offered an alternative, you can use an implied premium. Risk-free rate, beta, risk premium. Each number carries its own weight. Risk-free rate carries your currency weight. The beta reflects the businesses you're in. The equity risk premium reflects where you do business. Which brings me to the cost of debt. Cost of debt, as I said, is the rate at which you can borrow money long term today. To get the cost of debt, then I need to start with the risk free rate, the same risk free rate from which you did your cost of equity. So the currency choice drives this as well, and add a default spread on top of it. You think, where the heck am I going to get the default spread? Let's start easy. If you have a company with bonds outstanding, and you can look up the market interest rate in a traded bond, that should be a cost of debt today, right? It's already a market interest rate. And some people do this. They pick a bond that's liquid and traded, they look up the interest rate on the bond, and they use it as a cost of debt for the company. But here's the problem with that approach. Can a safe, or can a risky company issue a safe bond? Yeah, absolutely. What, is, what does it have to do? Take its safest assets, bundle them together, and issue the bonds against those safest assets. Do you see where I'm going? If I look up on Bloomberg one corporate bond issued by AT&T and take the interest rate on that bond and use it as a cost of debt for the entire company, I might be taking the safest part of the company and extrapolating to the rest of the company. So I would almost never use a yield to maturity in a traded bond as my cost of debt. Not because I don't trust the deal to maturity, but I don't think it's the right cost of debt for the entire company. But there's a bonus, right? If you have bonds outstanding, you usually also have a bond rating. You know that you can issue bonds without a bond rating. It's not required. Almost no one does it for a simple reason. If you go to the corporate bond market and say, we've decided to issue bonds, but we've chosen not to be rated, unless you're Tesla, in which case that's viewed as a plus. You know, you chose not to be rated. This is a good thing. Let's push up your bond price. Most companies, the bond price gets knocked down. So you have a rating. How does that help? If I told you that your company is BAA rated, I've told you your default spread, right? Because if the rating is right, and that's a big F, then we know typically what the default spread is for BAA rated companies. I'll actually send you the, it's, I think in, on Bloomberg, it's FIW. If you type it in, you get the default spreads by bond rating class as of right now. So you tell me your rating, I can look up the spread. So if you have a bond rating, my life got simpler. And for about 15% of all companies globally now, you'll be able to find a bond rating. There are about 4,000 something plus, or 10% of companies. Yes? But bond rating is also given for a specific class of No, no, you'll have a bond rating. When you go for a company, there's actually a rating for a bond and a rating for the company. Yeah. 
So make sure you get the bond rating for the company. I'm glad you brought it up because it's true. You can find a rating for a bond, but you also have a bond rating for the company. And you want the company's bond rating because that measures the overall risk of the company. But what if your company does not have a bond rating? 85, 90% of companies don't. Then you've got to play ratings agency and estimate a rating for this company and use that rating to come up with a default spread. It's what we call the synthetic rating in corporate finance. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus in on one ratio. Why one ratio? Because we're not bond traders. We don't want precision. We just want a rough estimate of risk. The ratio I latch on to with non-financial service companies is the interest coverage ratio. Earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest expense. So as an example for, two, for Embraer, in 2003, between 2001 and 2003, their average operating income was about 462 million. Why am I averaging out? Because when you're lending to a company, you don't lend based on last year's operating income, you lend based on what you think they can make over time. You divide by the interest expense, you come up with an interest coverage ratio of 3.56. So here's my challenge. I have an interest coverage ratio, but by itself it tells me nothing. If I can convert that interest coverage ratio into a rating, then maybe you can use the rating to come up with a default spread. So I create a lookup table. I create the lookup table by actually using the data that ratings agencies give me on rated companies and their ratings. So I take every rated company, I take the ratings, and based on the ratings, I do some reverse engineering. I said, this is what your rating will be if your interest coverage ratio is this number. So let's take a large company. If you're a large company and your interest coverage ratio is 8.5 or higher, if I ignore everything else, you're likely to have a very high rating, in this case, a triple A rating. If your interest coverage ratio is between six and a half and eight and a half, you're gonna have a double A rating. So basically, you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is, and whether you're a large company or a small company, I can go to this lookup table and come up with a synthetic rating for your company and a default spread for your company. So let's take Embraer, 3.56. Market cap was about seven or eight billion dollars in, in US dollar terms. Large company, I went to the first column, 3.56 puts me right there. The rating I would have for Embraer in 2004 would have been A minus, and the default spread that I've gone with the rating would have been 1%. I'm done. That then becomes my default spread for Embraer as a company. I'm going to use that to come up with a cost to that. There's one small glitch in this process though which is Embraer is a Brazilian company. You're saying, so what? Life isn't fair. If you're a US company and a Brazilian company with exactly the same interest coverage ratio, the Brazilian company is gonna end up with a lower rating than the US company. Ratings agencies actually used to be explicit about this bias. They used to have what's called a sovereign rating ceiling. You heard of these? There was a time when if you were a company in a country rated single B, you could never have a rating higher than single B. Your country imposed a ceiling on you. Okay? It was unfair because if you're a company in that country and you get all your revenues outside in dollars, you're saying, why are you constraining me? So about 15 years ago, S&P and Moody's abandoned that ceiling, but it's still in there, which means that if you look at two companies, one emerging market base and one developed market base, the emerging market company will often end up with a lower rating. What does that mean? As an emerging market company, you carry two burdens of risk on your shoulder. One is your burden as a company, the other is your country's default risk. You're saying that is so unfair. Yeah, talk to a Venezuelan company or a Greek company about what's unfair. Because think about how much country risk you're carrying on your shoulder. So here's what I'm going to do for Embraer. I'm going to start with the risk-free rate in US dollars because I was doing my analysis in US dollars. I'm going to add the 1% default spread. I almost added the entire 6%, which is the Brazilian default spread then. It was a huge default spread in 2004. When I factored in that Embraer gets 97% of its revenues in US dollars, and I actually looked at four other Brazilian companies like Embraer that were getting revenues outside, I could see what they, three of them had bonds outstanding. And it looked like they were evading some of the country risk, not all of it. So this two thirds is based, it's a very, you know, it's based on the three company sample of what their spreads were relative to the Brazilian government. It basically meant that Embraer was borrowing at a rate slightly lower than the Brazilian government because it was getting so much of its revenues outside Brazil. It can happen, many emerging markets, there will be export oriented companies that will be able to borrow at a lower rate because they can use their dollar revenues to back up their debt. So my cost of debt, is 9.29%, it incorporates both company risk and country risk. 
So let me back up. You have a company, I hope you picked the company, you want to estimate the cost of debt, first look for an easy way out, which is go check to see if your company has a rating. Even if it doesn't have bonds, it might already have a rating, but it's large enough. Okay. So if it has a rating, you're done. You can take the default spread, add it onto your risk-free rate, move on. If it doesn't have a rating, go through this process of estimating a synthetic rating. Use that synthetic rating to come up with the default spread. But if you have an emerging market company, remember to add the country spread as well. So when I took that country default spread out of the government bond rate to get to a risk-free rate, I told you that this number would come back again. It'll come back in your cost of equity as an equity risk premium and your cost of debt as a default spread. But you now have the discretion on how much it'll come back. Any questions on cost of debt? Yes? Yeah. Uh, the actual interest expense. You're not, actually not using an interest rate. You're using the interest expense. And this is why I said if you're able to get debt at a really low rate and lock it in, I'm going to give you a benefit. The benefit is not that I give you a lower cost of debt and your cost of capital overall, but I'm still adding a default spread, but the default spread is much lower than it would have been if you'd borrowed this money at a fair, I'm not going to give you a cost of debt lower than the risk-free debt, but I'm saying your default spread is lower because you have this debt. And the reason I make that point is, is will this pass? Yeah, when this debt gets refinanced, guess what? It's going to get refinanced at a much higher rate. This way I know that this is not forever. So when I recompute your cost of capital in year eight or year nine or year 10, you might see a much higher default spread. So you want to preserve that discretion for yourself rather than lock it in. So this process of synthetic ratings is, yeah, go ahead. Where about when you keep going down in the rear firms that have this, but actually negative? Interest coverage ratio. Some of you are, have, at least one person in every group should be doing a money losing company if you followed my instructions, right? Which you probably have not anyway, so. But if you take that money losing company and it has debt and it has no rating, and you try to compute an interest coverage ratio, what are you going to get? You're going to get a negative interest coverage ratio. If I go to that table, where would you be? You're in default, in which case, might as well stop this because a DCF is a going concern. If you have a money losing company, here are the two things you can do. One is, you can ask yourself, why would somebody lend to a money losing company? It's not because they hope you keep losing money, but that you will make money in the future. Which if you follow the reasoning, it's a dangerous reasoning, the interest coverage ratio they're using to assess your cost of debt today is based on expected operating income. So when you do that DCF and you're projecting out operating income, it's a very dangerous game. You take the expected operating income you're projecting for Tesla over the next 10 years, divide by the interest expense, you will come up with a positive interest coverage ratio and come up with the cost of debt. You say, this is a nightmare. I'm moving in circles. Here's the other alternative. Just use a double B or a triple B rating and move on. You can come back and fight this fight later, but why a double B or a triple B? Because a DCF implicitly assumes you're going to survive. And if you're going to survive, you're going to have to be pretty close to investment grade to survive. So you're giving them a cost of debt of a going concern. And after you're done with the valuation, I'll give you a way of adjusting for the fact that they might not make it. So my suggestion is take the second approach. If you have a money losing company, you've tried everything you can, you can't come up with an interest coverage ratio that makes sense or a synthetic rating, just use an investment grade rating to get the cost of capital for the moment and then come back later and do it because otherwise you're going to get stuck on this number for longer than you should be. So the synthetic rating table, the lookup table you saw, was a table that I developed using U.S. companies primarily. Why? Because that's where most rated companies still are. They're mostly U.S. companies. The table is getting more global as you get companies rated. But I'm often using this table in Vietnam and in Indonesia, countries where there are very few rated companies. And you might ask, do I feel uncomfortable using that rating to come up with a spread? I'll give you an answer that is very similar to the question that somebody asked about using dollar equity risk premiums with risk-free rates in other currencies. Remember what the answer I gave was? If your risk-free rate in another currency is close to the US risk-free rate, then you can get away using a dollar spread saying, hey, you know what, it's a constant on top of it. But if your risk-free rate is 10, 12, 15%, I said be very careful about taking these dollar risk premiums because you're gonna underestimate the premium. The same advice applies when you think about synthetic ratings. 
those interest coverage ratios were developed with US level interest rates. But if you operate in a market where the risk free rate is 15%, your interest rates are going to be higher, your, cost, your interest expenses are going to be high, you're going to end up with much lower interest coverage ratios even if you're the safest company in the market. So if you're using this table in a very high inflation market, come and talk to me because the ratings you're going to get are probably going to be way too low for the company. Forget about the country risk. This is actually the company level. But most of the time, I have no qualms about using these interest, this, this table to come up with, rating, with ratings and default spreads, even in emerging markets. Now, this default spread number, obviously, is a number that changes over time, just like the equity risk premium does. In fact, I went back. Remember that graph I showed you of the implied equity risk premium between September 12th of 2008 and December 31st, how much it moved during the crisis? Default spreads also moved during the crisis. In fact, I haven't looked at the BAA spread today, but I'll wager the BAA default spread jumped today, just as equity risk premiums jumped today. The two tend to move together. So during crises, don't sit on a default spread, no. and you never know when a crisis will start. So maybe this is the start of a crisis, so by the time you get to May, you're looking at numbers that are very different than when you started the year. Update the default spreads. And as I said, you can update it on Bloomberg. You can update it with using the Federal Reserve data. And I'll give you, send you that link as well. And you can see what those default spreads look like today. One final point on the cost of debt, and then we'll move on. Embraer used to be a Brazilian government-owned company. And the Brazilian government has a lot of pride in Embraer. It's a manufacturing company. It's a global manufacturing company. It competes in this aerospace, high-tech space, and they do it well. So one of the things the Brazilian government has had a history with Embraer is giving them subsidized loans. It's no, they don't do it anymore. But let's assume that the Brazilian government has given a loan in dollars to Embraer at 6%. Why is that subsidized? Remember, based on its default risk, it should be 9.29%. So I have a very simple question. You're computing the cost of capital for Embraer. Some or a big chunk of its debt is subsidized at this rate. When you compute your cost of capital, would you use that subsidized cost of debt of 6%? The cost of debt you computed at 9.25%. How would you split the difference, maybe come up with a difference? Do you see what I'm asking? If you have a green energy company that has a lot of subsidized, will you use that low rate in your cost of capital in your calculations? You want to? Yeah. So let's say I use the 9.25%, I come up with a value. Am I ignoring? Is there a benefit? First, is there a benefit to getting the subsidized loan? Absolutely. There is, right? So somewhere I've got to bring it in. If it's not in the cost of capital, and I agree with you, I don't want to bring it in the cost of capital. We'll talk about why. I've got to bring it in somewhere. Can I just value the subsidy? How would I value the subsidy? And, and, no, but, but take this, just this loan. What's the subsidy I'm getting? I'm borrowing at 6% of 9.29%, right? So if I take the loan amount and multiply it by 3.29%, I'm getting the extent of the subsidy every year. I discount that at the cost of debt. I can value the subsidy standing alone separately. I can do a traditional discounted cash flow valuation using the 9.25% cost of debt, and then at the end add the value of the subsidy. You're saying, why not just build it in? You know why I don't want to build in the cost of capital? If I put in a 6% cost and I forget that I put in the 6% cost, and I lock in, and I get to perpetuity, and I put that same cost of debt in, I'm assuming that I will continue to be subsidized in perpetuity. And here's the second reason. When governments give you gifts, do they expect something in return? I might be a cynic, but no government says, oh, I'm going to be nice and give you the subsidy. There's always another shoe waiting to drop. I remember valuing uh, an Indian sugar company for the family that owned it. And... Um, they were, um, they were getting this, this special subsidy deal from the, from, the, from the government, and they wanted to bring it into the cash flows. And I said, I'll bring it in, but what do they ask in return? They said, well, in return for the subsidy, we have to sell sugar at a controlled price, way below what we would charge. I said, okay, let's work out what the value of the subsidy is. We'll value the subsidy, and then we'll value how much you're giving up for the subsidy, and let's see net if you're coming out ahead. And it turned out that they were giving up three times more than they were getting as a subsidy. If you have a subsidy, it's best to keep it separate because sometimes as a company, you might say, look, thank you, but no thank you. 
What I lose by getting the subsidy is greater than what I gain. And the only way you can do it is to keep the subsidy separate from everything else. So we'll stop there. We're almost at the end of cost of capital. Next session, we'll start on cash earnings and cash flows. So try to get the cost of capital for your company done if you get a chance. They were recorded last year, right? They've asked me, so I have to put in the request, I think. So, but I think I can get them recorded. Thank you so much. Is that one place I okay. 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 You're welcome. Thank you.